My friends and I went on a camping trip for three days in the desert last fall, 2019. We went out to hike, explore, and go shooting where we could without posing danger to anyone else. There were about seven of us in total, and of those seven, myself and two others are emergency medical professionals. We'll call my two EMS friends A and E. We set up camp near the road in an area that had an embankment that would make for a good and safe range. The first day and night went well. However, I remember as the sun was setting, a truck slowly drove by with a large trailer in tow. Normally this wouldn't catch my eye, but I noticed the cargo, though covered, didn't look like it could be any sort of camping gear, and the truck bed was empty. The two men in the cab of the vehicle and I locked eyes as they passed. I gave a friendly wave and a smile, but they just stared at me, emotionless. After a moment, they both turned away and floored it out of sight, trailer rumbling in suit. I didn't think much of it at the time, so just went about my business for the night until bedtime. My second day was full of more hiking and shooting. We stopped at around dusk as to not disturb other nearby campers with loud gunfire. As darkness fell, we made our bonfire and cracked open a beer and just talked for quite some time. Amid the conversation, I saw a slight reddish glow drop behind a nearby hill and vanish. I brought it up with the group and asked, Did anyone else see that? No one else had seen what I did, so I excused it as mistaking it as an ember from the fire. Around ten minutes go by and I see it again, except it was high in the sky and deeper into the desert. It's a flare, said one of the group. An emergency flare, maybe. I added. We decided that if we see another one go off, some of us would go see if there was anyone in need of help as we brought advanced medical supplies. A few minutes go by and sure enough, we spot another flare, a little bit west of where the last one was seen. We made a plan, A, E, myself, and another one of our friends who we'll call Jay, and we would venture out in A's truck to find whoever needed help. Now certain areas of the desert we were in has been used by cartels as hidden transport routes before, so we also brought some of our firearms just in case we needed to protect ourselves from an attack. We loaded up our medical equipment, hopped into the truck and began driving out, leaving the others to keep watch if whoever needed help came to the camp. We headed in the direction of the last flare scene, windows rolled down, listening for calls for help as well as announcing that if someone was in distress, they should call out to us. Continuing on, another flare shot up further west than the last, illuminating the rocky hills in a dim red hue. I called out the direction, and we found a small dried ravine that we could use as passage. We turned down the dark ravine and drove for some time, the only light being that of the truck, which only seemed to make the overwhelming darkness that much more imposing. All while calling out but hearing nothing in return, another flare came up close by, but still too far to see anyone. We continued forward until we hit the end of the ravine, which led to somewhat of a natural cul-de-sac surrounding by rocky hills on three sides. We hopped out and searched the area for a bit with our flashlights. We yelled out again, but no one responded. It was empty, but we could have sworn this was where it came from. After searching a bit more to be thorough, we decided to check another area down the main road. The end of the ravine was tight for the truck, but there was just enough room to make a U-turn. Jay and I decided to hop in the truck bed for the search so we could see more than what the back seat would allow. As we turned out, a large cloud of dust and gravel hit me with a loud accompanying hiss. What the F just happened? yelled A. I think you blew a tire there, buddy, I replied. We hopped out and inspected and found that his rear passenger's side tire had blown, but I noticed something a bit off. The blow was on the wall of the tire and clean, not on the bottom and jagged as would be if it hit a sharp rock. I brought up how suspicious that was, but they reasoned that it must have just been a larger sharp stone. As they got the work replacing the tire with the spare, I stood watch. There was some difficulty with changing the wheel, the tire iron bent, and so did one of the lug nuts. As they worked, I heard something approach me quickly from the darkness. 
I immediately turned and drew my pistol, turning the light towards the sound. A large rock had rolled down one of the jagged hills to my right and stopped about ten feet from me. I shone my light up to the top. I didn't see anything but some small rocks and gravel still tumbling down the slope. I almost laughed at how I reacted, but then another rock began tumbling down towards me, a few feet away from the same area. I shined my light again, but saw no one. I became a bit paranoid. Those rocks were too big to be moved by any animal, and they both came from the same direction. I relayed the information to my friends, but they blew it off, saying I was getting too paranoid. I agreed that was a possibility, but I never let my guard down. My gut feeling was telling me something was wrong. I was on edge the whole time, even thinking to myself that the flares might be some kind of trap or lure. In the meantime, we were cracking jokes about our luck. Hey, this situation sucks, but I'm glad I'm in it with y'all, said A, and the feeling was mutual. My buddies had just finished up replacing the tire when yet another flare rocketed off in the sky near the ravine entrance we took and fell back down to earth nearby. We called out as we loaded back up into the truck, but once more, we were met with silence. We drove back down to the beginning of the trail and saw no one. We began to doubt if anyone was in trouble and if it was just some dumb kids playing around with a flare gun which is illegal to misuse. With that said, we weren't going to give up that easily. We began driving deeper into the desert on the main road when another flare was spotted. This one was what puzzled us. Up until then, they were all in roughly the same area. This one was way further northwest of the last one. How are they all the way over there now? I wondered. If these are some idiot teens doing this, we needed to tell them that they can't just go off causing worry like that. It's, it's really irresponsible, said E. We did agree that if that's the case, we should talk to them and their parents. We don't take emergencies lightly. We pushed on towards the last seen light, which led us to something that puzzled us even more. We arrived at a dark campsite surrounded by two hills. The headlights revealed two tents, scattered belongings, and an old fire pit. We exited the vehicle and began our approach on foot, but something was wrong. The tents were unoccupied, but still had a load of gear inside and out, and the fire pit was clearly stomped out with coals just barely glowing. It looked like it was quickly abandoned. Even if they went hiking or out on a walk, they left their equipment, shoes, packs, everything. As I searched, I found an even more unsettling sight. Shotgun shells. 12 gauge and they weren't old. They had to have been fired recently. There was no dust on them. Even after half a day in the desert, they'd be covered in dirt carried by the wind and they still smelled of gunpowder. I showed my buddies and they agreed this was too odd. We later found deep tire marks like someone left in a hurry. And that's when I saw it. It was an ominous orange glow coming from over the north hill that overlooked the abandoned campsite. I asked E to accompany me to go check it out. As we ascended the hill, we heard a small noise grow louder and louder. Once we reached the top, we looked down into a barren valley to see what I couldn't make out at first. What's that? asked E. I didn't answer him at first as I was focused on what was before us. Roughly 50 yards away, there was a large circle of dark figures in hoods and robes, arms stretched to their sides, and all of them vocalizing in a low chant. In the center was a wide ring of fire, and in the center of the flames, revealed by the fire's light, was an immensely large black pyramid frame. I mean, this thing was giant. A bit off behind the group, the truck and trailer I saw earlier with some other vehicles. I think it's a cult, I replied. As I spoke those words, the chanting stopped, and the group of what must have been fifty people all turned towards us in silence. At that moment, I realized I never turned off my flashlight. They all raised their arms once more and let out a horrifying and loud wail. First just one, and then they all began to join in until the sound was overtaking my own thoughts. We gotta get the F out of here, now! I told E in a hushed but anxious tone. We turned and booked it down the hill. 
Start the truck, he yelled. A and J looked at us confused and almost amused. <laughs> Why is that? Chuckled A. It's a cult, and they know we're here. I explained out of breath. A and J could see that we weren't playing, and so he ushered us into the truck and we hauled it out and back to camp. As we got back onto the main road, something happened that made A and J fully believe us and confirmed my suspicions about the flares. From every hill along the main road, flares shot up into the sky from all sides, illuminating the desert around us, either a warning or a threat. As we would drive, more and more would fly above us, encompassing the sky above until we got far enough away and the flares fell and faded behind us. We got back and explained everything to the rest of camp, happy to be back with our lives. They looked as though they didn't fully believe it, but they also knew we wouldn't just make something up like this. We speculated that that was either some kind of lure or a warning system for the cult. We slept close that night and kept firearms nearby. When we awoke, we cleaned up and got ready to leave. I was clearing debris from the range when I stumbled onto something that wasn't there before. A small wooden pyramid frame, charred black and still smoldering. I called attention to it and we promptly left. We got back and went on with our lives. I think back to this event every now and then and I'm thankful that my friends and I weren't harmed and I hope the owners of that abandoned camp were able to escape unscathed. I have no idea what that cult was or who those people were. I have no clue if they were a legitimate cult or just some people trying to prank campers. I'm fortunate that I've not had any other run-ins like this, but I now know there are some strange people in that desert. I was born and raised in South Carolina. It was always tough living there because I'm an African American lady. My family and I grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood. Both my parents are immigrants who worked hard to give my siblings and I a good life. So it was a Saturday evening when my parents went out on a date. I was 14 at the time and they trusted I would be able to babysit my little brother and sister. I'd done this a million times before so I wasn't worried. They left the house at around 8 and promised to be back no later than 11 p.m. Everything seemed perfectly fine at first. My brother was in the first living room playing on his Xbox. I was on the couch near him using my phone and my sister was upstairs in our room messing with her tablet. Now the layout of the house was something like this. You open the front door and immediately to your right you have the first living room. That leads into a dining room which leads into the kitchen. The kitchen is open and leads into the second living room. From there, you can access the backyard and door to the garage. On the left of the front door, you can go up the stairs to the bedrooms. On one side of the hall, you have my sister and I's room and a bathroom, and on the other, you have the master bedroom and my brother's room. I'm sitting on the couch with my brother. I then hear the garage door being opened. It was only around 9 p.m., and I knew my parents would never come back home this early. So I got up to meet them at the door and see why. Whenever they leave, I always make sure the door from the garage is locked, so I usually have to let them in. I walk up to the door, and just as I was about to open it, I stopped. I felt kind of anxious for whatever reason and didn't want to open up the door until I heard it was them. I see the doorknob wiggle violently, and I got scared and stepped back. I called out, Mom? No response. Dad, is that you? Stop messing around. Nothing. I started to get really scared. Dad, if this is you, please say something. I'm getting scared. After I said this, the wiggling got way more violent. It looked like the door was going to burst at any moment. By this point, my brother stopped playing his game and ran into the kitchen. Fearing for our lives, I ran into the kitchen grabbed one of the biggest knives we had, took my brother's hand and ran upstairs. There I grabbed my sister and ran into my brother's room. By now I heard the door burst open. I locked the door and hid my siblings in the closet while I pushed the dresser in front of the door to barricade it. After I did that I sat on his bed and called the cops. 
The operator got all of my details and said the cops would be there in five minutes. As I sat on the bed, I felt absolutely terrified. My mind was completely blank until I heard running up the stairs. The light sobbing in the closet from my siblings turned into fearful screams and I had my back against the wall shaking as I held the knife in front of me. I heard them bust through each door. Eventually they got to the end of the hall where my brother's room is and tried to open the door. They got angry and started banging and yelling at us to open up. I could tell by the voice that it was a man. Eventually he's able to bust the lock and slide the door open. We lock eyes as he tries to get past my little makeshift barricade. I get a good look at his face and his features. He couldn't have been more than 5'10 and had a stocky build and a very deep voice. He had, at least to me, very obviously gotten cosmetic surgery. His face looked incredibly artificial. His skin had this unnatural smoothness to it. He had these glossy big lips and his eyes seemed to be just a little too big. And I was on the verge of tears when I just yelled, Don't come any closer. The police are on their way. That seemed to stop him in his tracks. He took one last look at me when he ran down the stairs and out the front door. I ran to the closet to check on my siblings and see if they were alright. They were pretty shaken up, but other than that, they were okay. I heard the police finally pull up to my house about a minute later. An officer came in and yelled to see if we were alright. I remember being taken to the station with my siblings and calling my parents on the way too. We filed a report, but nothing came of it. I remember being so angry about it. There couldn't be that many people who looked like that in South Carolina. How was it so hard to find someone who left the crime scene within minutes before them arriving? So this has just happened recently. I work at a prison here in America and I've seen a lot of stuff. From having to do CPR on a man that hung himself and no one noticed for an hour, to seeing a dude cut his junk off. But just the other day, we had something that would stick with me forever. It was just a normal day, as normal as prison can be, that is. I had came in early for some overtime and the first shift was going fine for the most part. Shift change was happening and I had been moved to a first responder on the yard. I went to switch my gear and let Central Control know I had switched my gear over, but then... I need ERTs to the woodshop. Two inmates fighting, I hear over the comms. Now mind you, I've been in these situations more times than I can count. The oddity being that this was in the woodshop, where nothing ever happens. So I start running down to the woodshop... Halfway down, I hear over the radio, we need a gurney. So I run faster. Passing my other responder who was grabbing the gurney, I kept pushing my way to the wood shop. I run into the door. My sergeant, who was already here by this point, is clearing all the inmates out. My sergeant motions to me that there is someone over by the desk. I couldn't really see, so I walked over to the desk. And this is the most haunting thing I'd ever seen in my life burned into my memory. A man sitting on the ground, covered head to toe in blood, who was looking right at me with the most fearful expression I've ever seen. His eyes were so wide. God, those eyes. I immediately ripped open my ERT bag and took the cloth out and wrapped his head, yelling, I need towels. Someone get me some towels so I can apply pressure. No, I know who this inmate is, so I immediately call him by name and he looks at me. I then tell him to say where he was at so I can get an idea of how much is going on in his head. This man couldn't say a word. We get the towels and my other co-worker had finally brought the gurney down and we put him on it. I'm noticing a lot of damage to this man. His ear is torn, puncture wounds to the head, a broken arm, head concaved. We get him upstairs to EMS where I'm notified by my lieutenant that I'll be riding with him in the ambulance. I spent the next seven hours with this kid, being stapled together, seeing the damage done to his brain and so on. The doctor said the area of the brain that was damaged was that of speech, meaning that if he does pull through, he'll likely never speak again. And I later found out the details. 
Apparently another inmate beat him over the head with a 15 pound metal bar clamp 13 times and stabbed him with a sharpened screwdriver 6 times. I watched the camera footage and it was brutal. Today I saw his mother and told her what I did. She cried and said, you might have saved my son's life. Thank you so much. This kid is still in a coma and might die. I've seen my fair share of stuff like I've said but I will never get the look on this kid's face out of my mind. It will haunt me for the rest of my life. So this story takes place back in the early 2000s. I can't quite remember the exact year. It was late December and Christmas was just around the corner. My family tries to spend every other Christmas together and we rotate on whose house will host the entire family. That year it was my mother's turn. It was dinner time and as you can imagine with so many people in one house, it can get pretty crowded at the table. Mostly everyone decided that we're going to eat in the living room, something my mother didn't mind considering the fact that our kitchen table only sat four. I was sitting at the table next to my aunt with my small body. It was easy for me to sit on one side of the table with her. I had just stuck a large piece of broccoli on my fork and attempted to shove the vegetable in my mouth when it fell off my fork landing in the cup of juice that I had been drinking. I was disappointed but did the most rational thing in my mind. I got up with the intention of dumping out the drink in the sink. But before I could move, my aunt stopped me, questioning as to what I thought I was doing. I told her what happened and showed her the broccoli that was quickly starting to break apart in my drink. I turned to go dump the cup down the sink when my aunt stopped me again, telling me not to be wasteful and fish out the broccoli and drink the juice. I had laughed, thinking she was joking, telling her, you're crazy, in a joking manner. But she didn't take it that way. Oh boy, did she not take it that way at all. My aunt went eerily quiet and her face goes blank. I can instantly feel a cold chill run up my spine and I honestly had felt like I had stepped on a landmine. My aunt tells me in a low tone, Don't call me crazy. My smile had long been wiped away, and I tried my best to backpedal, explaining to her that I didn't think that she was actually crazy, that it was just a playful spin on words. This didn't go over well either, because she grabbed my arm and leaned in closer, repeating, Don't call me crazy. I instantly know that if I don't apologize, something bad would happen, so I quickly apologized to her and that seemed to satisfy her. She made me sit down and hovered over me until I ate the now extremely soggy broccoli and chugged down the cup of juice. Now this might not seem terrifying or scary at all. Well, that was just the setup for the events that were to follow that evening. Later that night, most of my family had gone out. I can't remember where, but the only people in the house were myself my older sister, my aunt, and her daughter, my second eldest cousin. I was sitting in my room watching TV when I started to hear yelling from the room over. It quickly got louder and I knew it was my aunt and cousin. I'm not sure what had started the whole thing, but I do know why it had escalated the way it did. The two were having an argument over something when my cousin told my aunt she was acting crazy. Yeah, she did the same thing I had done earlier, but unlike me, my cousin didn't apologize. She tried to explain to her, as I did, but just like before, she wasn't having any of that and my aunt exploded. I'm sitting in my room terrified when a loud bang from the wall causes me to jump. After the bang came my cousin's screams of pure terror. I was too scared to move until I heard rushing footsteps. I look at my door and soon see my sister running by. Next thing I know, I can hear my aunt screaming and ranting at the top of her lungs, my sister pleading and begging her to stop, and the sobs of my cousin along with a loud thud noise. I finally get enough courage to leave my room and look into the next room, and what I saw was an image seared into my mind to this day. My cousin was on the bed in a fetal position trying to make herself as small as possible, just sobbing. She had cried so much that she left a large wet spot on the bedspread. My sister is laying on top of her, using her own body as a shield, and my aunt is hovering over the two just screaming like a madwoman, and in her hand is one of her shoes. It was one of those woman loafers with a hard sole and slight heel. 
She was using the shoe to beat both my sister and cousin, swinging away trying to make contact with any amount of skin. She was really just trying to get my cousin, but didn't care that she was hitting my sister in the process. I'm frozen in absolute fear, never having seen anything like this before. Sure, my mother got mad at me and I got the occasional spanking, but nothing like this. I'm afraid to even say anything in fear that my aunt will turn on me and start attacking me. I slowly start to back away when I look to the ground that caused my eyes to widen. On the floor was my sister's jewelry box. It was all wood and had magnetic drawers to prevent the jewelry from spilling out if you knocked it over. It was just laying on the ground, all the drawers open and jewelry spilled on the floor. I looked at the box, then to my aunt and quickly figured out what that loud banging noise I heard earlier was. Yes, my aunt had thrown my sister's jewelry box at my cousin. Luckily my cousin dodged it and it hit the wall, but she had thrown it with so much force that it caused all the magnetic drawers to pop open. That's when I truly realized my aunt had lost it. I turned and ran back into my room, locking the door behind me, waiting for my mom to come home. I wasn't old enough to have a cell phone and we didn't have a house phone so there was no one I could call. I stayed in my room until the shouting stopped. Turns out my aunt had just gotten tired of hitting and yelling so she went outside to smoke. My sister hugged my cousin, comforting her until everyone else got home. What bothers me most is that the entire incident was just brushed off. No one said anything to my aunt, nor reprimanded her for her behavior. I think my aunt had made it all seem not like a big deal, that my cousin deserved it and so did my sister for defending her cousin when she was in the wrong. She was believed over us because we were kids and she was the adult. I know this isn't really as scary or terrifying as what other people have experienced, but out of all the messed up things that have occurred in my life, this had one of the bigger impacts. I can't even look at my aunt without thinking about it. I will say this, my family is finally starting to recognize the true person my aunt is, that her so-called discipline was actually abuse. They refuse to condone her behavior anymore, especially my mother. Despite the fact that I'm an adult now, my aunt still scares me, but at least now I have my family to back me up. I'm going to tell you all what it's like living with paranoid schizophrenia. Before I say anything, please refrain from commenting disrespectful things towards me and anyone involved. I just want to tell you my story, not to start any beef with anyone, but I don't mind legitimate questions. Thank you for understanding. Now context for the story, I am a strange case with schizophrenia. You see, people usually develop it when they're older, but I actually had all the symptoms for it growing up. It's still possible for children to get it, but it's rare. For me, I did hear voices and see things, but it truly got worse when I was 16. And before I fully start, there isn't really a distinct timeline. I'm just telling you all the events that have happened. Now the story, it was a build up to this day. For years, I kept hearing voices and seeing the same people over and over. And one day I was at school in Spanish class and it happened. My first episode. Everything went black and I was alone in a room and there was a light over me. Then a black figure walked up to me slowly. It didn't make any noise and next thing I knew my friend sitting next to me tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I was okay. She saw that I was sweating and looked horrified. I looked at her and grabbed my backpack and walked out of class. My teacher asked me where I was going and I ignored him. I went to the bathroom and those voices that really didn't sound like anything before started telling me to end my own life, murder someone, and worst of all, you're worthless. After that, I went straight to the counselor's office to talk. I walked in and he looked at me and asked what happened. I broke and said everything. He looked horrified and I refrained enough to not tell them what they were saying, but instead I was just hearing them. My mom came and picked me up and she is a mental health nurse and I told her everything. She wasn't really surprised to hear and told me she suspected as much and took me to a psychiatrist. After hearing my symptoms he diagnosed me with paranoid schizophrenia and he helped get a therapist and start taking medications. 
This was the beginning of an eventual downfall for my sports. Before all this, I was an elite athlete in both football and lacrosse. I was a four-year varsity goalie and a three-year varsity nose guard. At the time, I was six foot, 240 pounds of muscle and was running a 630 mile, benching 250, squatting 360 and deadlifting 320. The reason this is important is for what happened next. The medication I was prescribed had a major side effect of weight gain and within 30 days, I went from 240 pounds of muscle to 300 of fat. It was impossible to maintain anything. I was getting hungry all the time and my diet to maintain my body blew me up and working out like crazy didn't help. I went from being a D1 5 star athlete to not even going to college. I quit football senior year and finished lacrosse because it was my favorite but before my senior year let's go back to my major events. Did you know one of the main symptoms of a schizophrenic is false memory? Well, I actually believed for a period of time that my mom was verbally abusing me. Sadly, this ruined my relationship with her for years, but it took me until three months ago to realize it was a fake memory. I'm happy to say I fixed my relationship and we are closer than ever. Other things I went through were reality distortion, meaning I lost touch with my surroundings. You know in the movies where mental people are saying the government is making them do this? Well, that's real, but mine were different. I believed a random person was trying to murder me and really hurt me. My paranoia was bad. I couldn't be home alone without having an anxiety attack. I was afraid of living in my own home. I was afraid of being in a car. And I was afraid to sleep as it made me completely vulnerable to being killed, so I thought. I didn't leave my room for a month at one point and yes, I missed a month of school. Lucky for me, I was originally a top student, never was late, had a 4.0 and was an athlete so the school was worried about me and it was a lot to explain. I went back to school and finished my sophomore year and junior year started and it was getting worse. I was losing hope for my life. I was paranoid that I wasn't living a real life. And one day, I'll just wake up in the hospital bounded. I thought my friends weren't even real. A breaking point was during English, I lost touch with reality and saw the black figure grab my arm and was trying to break it, and I started screaming in agony. My homie Mac saw it and pulled me back. Everyone was staring. Mac, being an amazing guy, grabbed my backpack and walked me out, called my dad, and I left school. That's the thing I was blessed with, my friends. All of them never left me. Instead, they supported me and always reached out. I still thank them to this day, though I was still struggling a lot. As time went on, new voices would form. At first, it was three voices and a shadow man. One voice was aggressive, with it telling to kill and another to end my own life, and another told me I was worthless. The reason that hurt was the false memories of the verbal abuse. My mom told me that, and... It still hurts hearing that word. I eventually formed two new voices. One was a woman, constantly screaming and telling me everything is okay and to trust her. I don't. The last one became the alpha voice. I actually named him Trey. No reason, it just felt right. But he was an actual manifestation of a man. A man that has many qualities of people I know and he actually is always around. He says whatever he wants, but... It's always a back and forth of destruction in life. He would say stuff like, Your family hates you. You lie. You're an embarrassment to them. Your friends are just using you as a sob story. And then say things like, It's all okay. You're stronger than this. You're loved. He, he does scare me the most, but since he appeared, a lot of the others took a back seat and haven't been too active. Now the second semester of my junior year I got homeschooled, but I dual enrolled into that in my high school so I could continue sports. However, I had a rough junior year. For lacrosse I actually still finished 10th in the state of California. I regressed, but it was still good enough. My GPA took a huge hit and I became a 3.2 student. My lowest I hit was a 2.8. I was still getting offers, but a lot of the top tier ones were pulling out, seeing me drop so drastically. A thing, though, I didn't want to change was throughout 
all of this, my lacrosse and football team didn't know I had schizophrenia. Only my friends who played sports with me. And I was actually helping my teammates out with their issues, and some were bad too. I was happy that I could use my issues to help and understand others, and it was homeschooling that was helping dramatically. I was in a good space for a bit, but still having a hard time, and my senior year came and I quit football as the season before I tore the ligament and tendon in my right thumb, and it's still damaged to this day. I was out for eight months, and I healed luckily before lacrosse season, but I was done with football. Another main reason for quitting was to pursue art, specifically comics. During all of this, I was trying to make a comic book, but I took a pause on it but my experiences now are being used to fuel my comic and drawing throughout all of this was keeping me together. Sorry for the runoff, I just wanted to say that bit. To continue, my senior year started and my homeschooling was doing good and so was my health a bit, but that came back to bite me. I started to lose touch with reality a lot more and I almost hurt someone in my life who was precious to me. I saw them as a murderer trying to kill me and I was about to attack, but I pulled myself out of it before anything. They hugged me and told me it was fine. They understood, and I cried really hard. I couldn't believe I almost hurt my sister. Though after that day it got better and I managed to squeeze through my senior year without a freakout. I thanked my coach beyond anything as he was like my second dad and helped me out as much as he could. I finished my lacrosse career 7th in the state and 20th in the nation, I was awarded an MVP award. I was known as the true heart and soul of the team, someone who helped everyone and always was there for my teammates. I gave a speech at the banquet about my story and I got a standing ovation. I was highly respected and my story spread in the lacrosse community as I was already respected and now people saw me as a true inspiration. The story doesn't end there, however. After my senior year, I got accepted to the Los Angeles Film School and studied animation, but my illness had one last thing to do. I almost ended my own life in my sleep. I thought I was dreaming, but instead I just lost touch with reality. I had that attack, and it was the last I had until now. After that, I dropped out of school and took time to fix myself. I started to coach goalies in town and have been very successful in it. I'm only 19 and already got a goalie committed to a college. My mental health took a lot of time to fix and a lot of power to control. Yes, I still have bad days, but I know I'm strong. I know I can get through it. I tell myself every day I am where I am because I'm strong. No one can bring me down now. I just recently got my comic book published and am the town's very own goalie coach. I work a lot and think a lot to help keep focus on other things. I still have a long way to go before I feel comfortable doing a strange act called dating as I want to be the best man to a girl as I can be. I have to thank my friends, family, doctors, and even my homeschool teacher, love you Mr. Davidson, for helping me get to where I am. Yes, I'm a college dropout, but hey, I'm happy as I could be now and nothing is stopping this momentum. One last piece of advice. I wrote a quote during the dark times that really helped me and Hopefully it can help someone else too. Worthless people can do great things because they're trying to prove to the world that they are in fact not worthless. This story takes place in Santa Clarita, one of the safest towns in America. During the story I was between 10 and 17 years old. I'm now 19. Some context, we lived in a two-story house that had two bedrooms downstairs and three upstairs. My family consisted of mom, dad, older brother, older sister, five dogs, and me, the youngest. Last thing my family believed, my sister and I had a third eye since we could predict a lot of stuff. But for now, we are only going over the spirits part of it. Now we begin. The experiences started pretty much right away when we moved in. One night when I was taking a shower, I saw a little girl outside of it, looking at me. She looked to be around six or seven. She had long, straight black hair and was wearing white pajamas. But after that, I got out and she ran away and I followed her. She disappeared completely when she went to my sister's room. 
and I actually saw her later that night in my dreams. She told me her name was Alice and she needed mine and my sister's help getting rid of two bad men. I agreed, but first she needed my sister to see her. So she played with my sister's stuffed animals and then my sister asked me if I touched them. I told her it was Alice and that Alice wanted to talk to her. Of course my sister freaked, but she'd meet Alice later that night and my sister agreed to help. The last request Alice made was not to tell anyone else, as once I do, they will all be able to see the man in her. After that talk, I immediately saw one of the men. I went to the bathroom, and walking back from it, I saw a really tall, white-sheeted figure standing in the loft. He looked at me, and I felt so much fear, anxiety, and dread. He came after me, and I ran to my room and closed the door. I cried hard, really hard. I couldn't stop because I was feeling pure terror course through me. After that, I questioned if I should even bother helping, but I still tried. Time and time again, I would run into him and he would chase me. He never really made noise, but he would tell me to stop running, and I never listened. It took a few months, but I finally broke and told my family. They all believed me as they were feeling the pressure from him and were all getting stress from it. Well, after that, my father saw the white figure. He was facing a corner of the loft and looked back at my dad, and it terrified him. For my brother, however, he never saw anything at a house. He only felt certain pressures, but he did manage to record my guardian angel one time opening his room door and checking on me. I'm still sad that the phone that had the video was destroyed in an accident. Now moving to my mom, she was actually able to communicate with the man but doesn't remember a single thing he said as most of the memories in that house disappeared from her, mainly due to my mom's mental illnesses. But my sister did manage to see my mom talking to the air, but it was weird. My sister heard a deep male voice that had a lot of authority to it next to my mom. However, she recognized the voice was coming from my mom and it scared my sister very badly. After that incident, time went by and... My tia, my aunt, and my nina, grandmother, moved in with us and they had experienced numerous things. First, my tia kept on hearing running upstairs when she was home alone. She would hear thumping and bangs and even two male voices talking. My nina, on the other hand, met Alice but sadly couldn't communicate with her. The last story with them is about my tia. She got up really early every morning to go to work, like four in the morning, and one time when she was going upstairs to use the bathroom... She bumped into someone really hard that was knocked down and there was no one around and realized she didn't even hear anyone else make a noise or fall. Those are the only stories I have of my Tia and Nina but moving on. So I got five dogs at the time of all of this and all of them would look upstairs and growl, bark and just watch it very intently. One time my poodle went upstairs and something hurt her very badly. We had to get a cast for her paw because it seemed that something had crushed her paw. Last small story before we get back to the main story is about my friends. They to this day say that the night that they spent in the loft is the scariest moment for all of them. You see, there were four of them and the first time they came over was when everything barely started happening. I had them sleep in the loft and they all said that a tall sheeted man was harassing them all night and scaring them. At the time, they were the only ones to see his face, and they said half of his face looked cut off. My friends would come over almost every weekend, but after that moment refused to go anywhere near the loft. Now to get back on track, after some time I started to see visions in my sleep of Alice's death. She was taken by the sheeted man and brought to another man who wore a very dirty suit. He looked very disorganized, but... He had Freddy Krueger type gloves and slashed Alice. I kept seeing this over and over until one day I saw the killer. When I had to take a shower, I would have to cross the loft and there I saw him, crawling on all fours, stared at me intently with so much hate. He gave off an even more sinister presence than the white sheet. He was pure evil and something I didn't want to deal with anymore. Unlike the white sheet, killer never attacked anyone, but he was just a terror. Have you seen the movie Insidious and the scene where the medium draws the demon on the ceiling? He's similar to that, and he even would crawl up walls like that. 
After he started to show himself, my dad saw him and actually started to sleep downstairs instead of his room because of how often he was seeing him in the room and scaring my father. My sister was getting super stressed from everything and told Alice she wasn't helping anymore. My sister never saw Alice after that. For me, there wasn't anything I could even do. I was too scared to even look at the man and I was getting mentally drained from seeing them all the time that I told Alice I was done too. I was 15 then, and Alice looked sad and disappointed at that and told me goodbye. I didn't want her to leave, but I couldn't stop her, and she vanished, and that was the last I saw her and the two men. Things actually calmed down a little bit, but my family started to break down. My parents divorced because my brother almost died in college, and my dad refused to travel to see him, and my mom never forgave him for that. My sister suffered with major depression and bipolar and even PTSD from everything. As for me, the events from Alice and the men and other personal stuff drove me to a breaking point and I developed paranoid schizophrenia. The paranoia of not seeing the man anymore, the feeling of dread, and death lingered drove the development. The spirits mixed with anger and hatred from everyone built and broke everyone. We decided we need to move on from that house, so we moved to where we are now. Now everything seems to be fine. My brother is in good health. My sister lives in Seattle pursuing her dream of music producing. My mom and dad decided it was best to live together still and me who had moved on professionally. Things really hit the fan in the old place and it almost tore my family apart. The anger and fear that the old house had was too much for us to handle. Now we still have paranormal activity but a complete 180 compared to that old house. If I were to give advice to anyone about spirits... Never help them as sometimes they will pull you and everyone else into something none of you have the power to help with. Reading and listening to these stories has brought up an old memory that I thought might be interesting to share. This happened when I was 15 years old. I would like to say I'm a female and definitely did not look older than my age. In fact, most people thought I was younger. I had just moved about four hours away from another state, and one of my friends from my old school was visiting for the week. We decided to start this trip by shopping in a large mall close to my new house. Thanks to me being an avid Pinterest user at the time, and us being teenagers that wanted to look cute, we decided to dress nice just for fun. I was wearing a somewhat short skirt and knee-high socks. Yes, I know that sounds somewhat like a stripper, but it was all the rage on the fashion side of Pinterest at the time. My friend, who I'll refer to as Haley, was also wearing a skirt. My mother and younger sister was also in the mall, but we had gone our separate ways. As, like most teenagers, we wanted to be independent. We started our shopping at the store Pink, which if you don't already know is a branch off of Victoria's Secret, but for teenagers rather than adults. The store only sells clothes for girls focusing on teens. I've always been paranoid and I'm the type of person that is always scanning the people around me just because I like to be aware. When we entered the store I instantly noticed a man who looked to be in his mid-30s to 40s. He stood still, not shopping around and he looked nervous. You could see that he was sweating. My first thought was that he was a father to some teenage girl and was maybe uncomfortable with the type of clothing the store sells. Either way, he made me feel uncomfortable, so I moved to the other side of the store and Haley followed. As I was shopping around, I turned to my left and saw the same man. Only this time, he was looking at a pink hoodie as if shopping. Red flags instantly popped up. The man had not been shopping around before, and now was looking at hoodies made for teenage girls. I couldn't say for sure if he had followed us, but something in my gut said he did and that I needed to get away. Without saying anything to Haley, I simply walked out the store and right into the store next door. Haley was obviously confused and asked me what was up. I told her I thought a man had followed us around the store and I wanted to get out. She told me I was being dramatic and it was probably just a coincidence. Almost as if on cue, right then the same man in the store we were in started to look at female shoes. I pointed him out and told her that was the man and as soon as he noticed that we had seen him, he left the store. Haley took me more seriously now but still didn't really believe he was following us. 
I, on the other hand, was already freaking out. Abercrombie was right across the mall, maybe 40 feet from the store we were currently in. Haley said we should walk into Abercrombie so that if he follows us inside, we know for sure that he's following us. Scared out of my mind to leave our little store, we quickly fast-walked into Abercrombie. Once inside, we walked a little into the store so it wasn't so obvious and waited. We then saw the man casually walking around the mall making a big loop, I'm assuming to not be so obvious, and headed right for us. At that point, even Haley started to panic. We started to walk further into the store while discussing our options. It's crazy how alone you can feel during situations like this, even when you're surrounded by people. Haley wanted to go somewhere like a dressing room to hide from him, but I didn't want to be anywhere out of the public eye. We decided to go to the back of the store where the checkout area was and tell one of the employees. If you've ever been inside of Abercrombie, it's split into two sides, the male side and female side with the registers in the back. As we moved, we saw the man clearly start walking into the female side of the store, confirming even more that he wasn't simply shopping around. Both Haley and I were shaking at this point while rushing to the back. We ran up to the first male employee we saw and told him that there is a man following us. He started to ask us a question. I can't remember what anymore and right then we saw the creep turning the corner into the area that we were in. We quickly pointed him out to the Abercrombie worker and as soon as he saw we were talking to someone, he took off. The employee happened to actually be the manager and was completely shocked when we told him what had happened. He walked us up to the front of the store and we looked for him but didn't see him. He told us to walk around for a minute and come back while he watched to see if the man is still around. Thankfully the creep didn't come back, apparently deciding dealing with the manager was too much work. We eventually went on our way and tried to enjoy the rest of the day but I was scared the whole time and really just wanted to go home. I called my mom after the whole ordeal and told her what had happened and at the end of our shopping trip she took us back to Abercrombie to thank the man who helped us. This story seemed like it was a perfect happy ending but that's just not how this world works. While talking to the manager inside Abercrombie, we noticed someone walking around the mall in a familiar hoodie. That's right. The same man was walking around casually, holding a drink in his hand, looking like a normal guy. We all watched in horror from the store window as the man turned to walk back into the store pink again. I don't know what happened after this. I believe they called mall security on the man, but I'm not sure what followed after that. I'm still so grateful for my paranoid self noticing him as soon as I did and for the amazing manager at Abercrombie for saving us. My friend flew into town to LA to visit me from the UK. She had a few stops she wanted to visit while in town, starting off with Hollywood Boulevard and the stars. We were walking down, trying to find her favorite ones. I really didn't care, I live here. I can see them any time and not really paying attention. Our only thoughts were of the stars that we saw and photo ops taken. We didn't notice being approached by a single harmless looking man in a suit until he approached and actually initiated conversation with us instead of just kind of continuing on his way. He asked us if we wanted to take a personality test and she was rather interested. He never mentioned that he was from the Church of Scientology or that we would be there for literally hours taking this test. It had to be at least a hundred pages, and at one point, I was starting to get cranky and hungry. He'd interrupted our dinner plans, of which I told him we had plans and needed to be leaving. The truth was, I was getting nervous. They had specifically split up my friend and I and tried to appease us with a strange cheese plate in the meantime while we finished. Her phone didn't work since she was from the UK, so I couldn't just text her and tell her we needed to leave and the place was creepy. I sped through the test, just making up nonsense answers for every answer just to get through it so I could say I was done and needed to see my friend. They told me I could not. This was the point where I started to get really freaked out, and they brought me to the small room to try to hard sell me on their program. I told them I had no interest, but the hard sell continued and at that point I stood up to leave and the secretary boxed me in. I told them I'd call the police if they didn't allow me to leave and to have my friend back. 
Fortunately, they released her quite easily and it didn't ramp up. She was from the UK. They could not get money from her. They didn't care as much as they did with me. And needless to say, we ran away fast. We didn't look back, nor did we give our real names in the first place or any real contact information. We at least had enough sense to do that. And in summary, never accept strange cheese plates from cults. So back in 2015, I was a freshman in high school. On one weekend, I went to go down to my friend Andrew's house to meet up with other friends to go into D.C. We had a great time in D.C., but now it was getting dark outside, so we all started getting back on one of the trains. At first, it was all nothing, not becoming unnerved at first until we stopped at the Bethesda station, and four guys came in and were singing obnoxiously loud in the train and trying to intimidate people on the train. One of my friends, Gabby, was starting to get a bit scared. The loud singing woke up my friend Andrew. He immediately knew something was up, as all of my other friends knew as well. The final stop where we got off was the stop the four guys got off as well, but they were ahead of us, so we thought that it was over. After that, we started heading towards the parking lot, but my friend's mom wasn't there to pick us up, so we all stood there to wait. We were all talking in a circle, then... Out of the blue, the four loud guys from earlier were walking towards us, but with more people this time. This now big group of people were walking around us and circling us, trying to intimidate us. We didn't know what was going to happen, so we all stood there just to wait for them to make their first move. This group started then trying another intimidation tactic, which was starting to low-key scare my friends Gabby and Kimmy, but... We all didn't make the first move. They broke into our social circle and were getting close to all of us and even was stepping on some of our shoes and one of them said, So y'all like reading books, huh? My friend Andrew was slowly pulling out and trying to hide the fact that he was pulling out a knife and so was I, but one of them saw it. So we were expecting to have a fight start to happen, but thankfully they all realized this possible robbery attempt might not be easy because some of us weren't going to go without a fight. Thankfully, they all started heading away, but it was still a very unnerving experience. About a week later, a local news station posted on Twitter that a man was beaten to death and robbed at that same metro station. I still wonder to this day if that was the same group of people we had encountered a couple of weeks prior. So I know you might not read this or put it in your video, but I have a crazy story that I have to get off my shoulders. About six to seven years ago, I was 11 years old, going to middle school down the street from my home. One day I'm walking home and everything was fine. I got home and I laid down in my bedroom, I was at the front of the house, and my sister was directly across from mine, but her window faced the backyard. I was playing on my iPod I used to have because my parents refused to get me a phone, so... I'm lying down minding my own business and I hear a really loud boom and five seconds later my sister comes running into my room asking if I heard that and I said yes. Being 11 I really didn't think much of it and just looked out the window and saw fire and a lot of smoke coming from the building near my house. Being young and not really caring I just ignored it and went about my business. Seven years later I found out that they were cooking meth and some other drug I can't remember now, and someone used a wrong ingredient and exploded the whole building, killing about 20 to 30 people working there. Still to this day, I pass by that place, and it gives me chills. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, 
located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I'm a dude, he's a dude, she's a dude, because we're all dudes, yeah. <laughs>